So next up, we've got George Howitt uh, back in Melbourne. Uh, Anti-glitches in accreting pulsars. Take it away, George. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, so I'm George Howard. I'm a postdoc here with Andrew Malatos at uh, the Melbourne Uni Osgrave Node, and uh, this wordy title is what I'll be talking about. Um, so here's where we'll be going over the next uh, 12 minutes. So what are pulsar glitches? Um, not that. Uh, so most pulsars that we see isolated pulsars, um, we see them spin down over time. So this top plot here is showing you uh, the crab pulsar over 45 years. You can see the spin frequency steadily decreasing. But in some pulsars, we occasionally see these sort of sudden spin-up events against this background uh, steady spin down, which is called a glitch. So this bottom picture is showing you basically the timing residuals. Uh, so when you subtract off your nice spin down model from the crab, um, every now and again, you have this sort of sudden jump that you have to resolve. And that's, uh, that's what a glitch is. Um, so the kind of characteristics of glitches is that uh, in the most case, um, they're, they're instantaneous to the, to the precision we can measure them, except, except this one that I've, I've shown, maybe I should have chosen a more representative example. Um, they're typically sort of pretty uh, violent events. They change the spin frequency by kind of one to 1,000 parts per billion. Um, in the pulsars we've seen glitches in, that sort of accounts for about 10% of the whole pulsar population, though it's probably quite a bit higher than that. And in those where we see multiple glitches, they sort of occur every sort of few years on average. Uh, and we characterize glitches by these two observables, which are the size, usually expressed as the fractional change in the spin frequency and the waiting time between glitches. Uh, so in the, over the last 50 years, sort of what causes glitches has been quite an open question. And it's, it's a hard thing to answer because you have to account for this uh, large diversity in, in the population of glitches. In particular, this plot sort of shows you have many decades uh, of, of glitch sizes, both sort of in the population of, um, as a whole and even within uh, particular objects. So you need a model that can kind of account for that. Um, so generally speaking, most models say that so the crust, which is what you're observing, is spinning down, and there's some internal component of the neutron star that is uh, um, lagging that, that spin down, so you have some differential rotation that periodically recouples, uh, causing, a, causing a glitch. Um, so I've been talking about glitches, but the title said anti-glitches. So what is an anti-glitch? Uh, so if a, if a regular glitch is a spin up, uh, an anti-glitch is a sudden spin down. Um, so this recent observation of, of uh, an anti-glitch in a accretion powered pulsar, we also see them in magnetars, but that's probably different physics. Uh, so I won't be talking about it. Um, kind of goes like this. So our, our usual picture is, is the left-hand side where we have um, the kind of steady spin down of the crust, and that's what you're seeing with your telescopes. Uh, then this internal component that's decoupled from that. Uh, at some time, it recouples, transferring angular momentum back to the crust, which spins up. Now, if you had the opposite case here, where the, um, the neutron star was spinning up, maybe due to accretion, then uh, that interior part is decoupled, but it's now, it's now lagging a crust. So when they do recouple, you're gonna spin down. Um, and that's, uh, that's sort of the picture I'll be exploring in a bit more detail here. Um, so superfluid vortex avalanches are a, are a possible explanation for this, and, and the reason why is a little bit uh, convoluted, so I'll try and go through it as quickly as possible. But for various sort of theoretical and observational reasons, we think there's a neutron uh, superfluid somewhere inside neutron stars. And the curious thing about uh, superfluids is they can't rotate as a solid body because they have no viscosity. So instead, they do rotate, but they form vortices uh, with quantized circulation and sort of on large enough scales, these vortices sort of mimic solid body rotation. So basically this, this bottom equation says that the number of vortices in the star is determined by uh, the rotation frequency or the angular velocity. And um, it's, it's these units of, of uh, quantized circulation that are very small. So you have many, many, many vortices inside a neutron star. Um, and so the vortex avalanche model goes that you have this star that's spinning down uh, in, a, in a perfect universe, uh, the vortices would sort of move outwards to maintain co-rotation with the star. But there's all this stuff inside neutron stars that uh, kind of causes them to get stuck. And so you build up this differential rotation. So this movie is sort of showing how this goes, um, where these, these pinned vortices uh, eventually unpin because this lag just grows and grows until they can't bear it anymore. And when one vortex unpins, you kind of get it, it uh, tells its neighbors how good this is moving outwards and uh, they, they join in the fun and you get this sort of avalanche process. And then after some time that kind of wears itself out and they, they re-pin. 
Um, and so this, you know, the motion of the vortices transfers angular momentum from the superfluid into uh, the rest of the star and that spins it up, causing glitch. <clears throat> so um, the anti-glitches I mentioned earlier uh, were observed in this interesting object called NGC 300-12X1. So this is a high mass X-ray binary in a nearby galaxy. Um, it's, a, it's a neutron star with a high mass companion. Uh, and you can measure a pulse frequency when it's in when it's in outburst. So this um, this neutron star is accreting matter from its from its companion, and as it does so, it's actually spinning up. Um, so it's it's pretty slow at the moment, but it's spinning up quite fast. And in this sort of hundred day timing campaign with the NISA uh, instrument on board the space station, they they looked at it uh, for a while. They saw it spinning up, but as you may be able to see in this plot, in a few points uh, in the sort of middle of A, middle of B, and then between E and F. Um, you had uh, these, these sudden spin downs, um, which are called anti-glitches. So this is really interesting because it's the exact opposite of the typical pulsar glitch scenario, which we've seen some hundreds. These are the first time we've ever seen um, spin down events in an uh, accelerating pulsar. So we want to know if this superfluid vortex avalanche model, which does a decent job of explaining regular pulsar glitches, can also apply in this scenario. Uh, so to do that, we need to use this, well, we don't need to, but the way I do it is using this point vortex model, um, which I worked on in my PhD. So because um, you have a lot of these vortices, uh, you want to you wanna simulate as many of them as you can. So you take a few simplifying assumptions, um, which is basically using classical uh, point vortex hydrodynamics. Uh, and you make a further simplifying assumption of, of doing it in 2D, and basically you can solve for the velocity of each vortex with this um, sort of be a Savart type equation. You, you get your vortex distribution, you find the velocity of all the vortices, step forward in time, rinse and repeat. Um, so uh, yeah, so I wrote this code that does this um, and I won't go into the details of it, but basically this, this picture sort of shows, shows what we get from this code. So we start with some configuration of pin vortices. We start spinning down the container they're in and you can see over time that they, they undergo these avalanches. And sometimes they're small, sometimes they're really big. They're kind of pretty random in time. Um, it's not a whole lot of correlation between the size and waiting time. So this is sort of exactly what we expect from the vortex avalanche model. And it does an okay job of, um, you know, the, the distributions we get uh, from, from these simulations uh, don't look too dissimilar to what we see in actual glitching pulsars. So that's nice. So then the question was, can we do the same thing um, if instead of spinning down, we spin it up. Uh, so with a very small modification to the code, uh, basically just allowing for, as you spin up the, the star, you're gonna need more vortices. Um, so we, we, we made that modification, we ran the simulation with the, uh, with the torque kind of sign reverse. And in fact, we do see avalanches exactly as we do in the spin down case. Only this time, as you might be able to tell, they're sort of moving inwards. So these are, these are anti-glitches. So this is pretty cool with just sort of changing the sign of the talk, this, um, this point vortex model gives you both uh, glitches and anti-glitches. Um, so we don't need whole new physics to explain uh, this, this newly observed phenomenon of anti-glitches in this um, accelerating pulsar. So that's nice. Uh, so then a natural question after that is, well, are these just sort of time reverse copies of one another? One another? Do the glitches and anti-glitches look the same? Because from the physics, it seems like they would. Um, so these, these plots are showing the, the um, angular velocity evolution in these, those two simulations I showed the movie of before. So these start with the same initial condition, um, but uh, one spins up, one spins down. Um, so you can see uh, both of them undergo these, these jumps all the time. Um, but when we looked at the statistics, we sort of found that uh, Generally speaking, the anti-glitches are smaller and more frequent. So you kind of have the same amount of spin up or down with the same kind of um, torque applied, but, but the path there is a little bit different. And this actually holds, you know, even if you start from the endpoints of these simulations and just turn them back around, they don't go along the same path. If you're spinning up, you always get smaller uh, avalanches more frequently. So, we have no idea why this is happening. This work is still in progress, but we've tried a lot of things to look at it and can't really come up with an explanation. So, um, you know, if, if anyone has uh, any ideas, I'll, uh, I'll entertain that. Um, I've got some backup slides if anyone wants to look at what, what we have tried. But uh, summing up, 
Um, so we recently found anti-glitches in this accelerating pulsar NGC 300 Dual X1, and that's very interesting because it's the sort of uh, exact analog of, of our typical glitches in uh, isolated decelerating pulsars. And with this vortex avalanche model, you can very neatly um, kind of replicate uh, both both the glitches and the anti-glitches. So that's sort of a, a tick in the box for that model that I'm not sure other models can do. Um, we do see this intriguing discrepancy between the, the um, distributions of the two, two events, but you know, with only three anti-glitches, it's very hard to say whether that's uh, something that's borne out in, in the data. So you know, if anyone can, uh, is an X-ray astronomer that can find more of these uh, cool ULXs, uh, start looking at them. Thanks everyone. Thanks for a great talk, George. Uh, so we've got time for some questions. Uh, so Lucy got in first. Uh, why haven't we seen an anti-glitch in an accelerating pulsar before? I assume that means a, a pulsar spinning up. Uh, is it because we haven't been looking or is there something rare or special about this case? Yeah, it's sort of a rare and special case in that we don't really see any accelerating pulsars. So this is a pretty um, unique situation. I, I think these, so these ULXs are usually in other galaxies, um, even if they are accreting, they're not always spinning down. They're not visible all the time, so you can't kind of get consistent enough timing to be able to see glitches. Interestingly, there was another one, another of these ULXs, which saw a spin up glitch while it was spinning down, but that same pulsar has been observed uh, previously to be spinning up. So maybe if you look at that um, while it's spinning up, you might see an anti-glitch, but yeah, they're, they're just kind of rare and, and hard to find. All right, thank you. Uh, Daniel Price, I think it's this one in Melbourne. Oh no, they're both in Melbourne. One of the Daniel Prices asks, does the vortex avalanche model naturally explain why glitches preferentially occur in young pulsars? Um, I think mm, not, not naturally to my mind. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of parameters that go into how frequently they glitch. Um, so maybe it's just that by the time they're old, they're just sort of spinning down slower, for instance, um, kind of relative to, to birth. So that might be it, but I don't have an a extremely obvious answer for you. Uh, Thomas Nordlander has just asked if we could see some backup slides, but Stefan Sons, sure that, that won't happen. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, so I'll just ask one last one from Rio, and then there's some more questions for you to answer on the chat. Um, so Ryosuke Harai asks, would you expect a qualitative difference if you extend your simulations to three dimensions? Uh, you might do, because then you'll get things like um, vortex tangles, so that sort of could be another way to kind of dissipate this stress or, or make it harder to have glitches or avalanches and stuff. Yeah, 3D is a very interesting case we would like to do eventually, but it's... Um, there's a few, not just computationally, there's a few sort of non obvious um, theoretical parts of the model that we don't exactly know how to extend to 3D yet. But that would be nice. There's another 3D code that gets used in your group, right? Like, does that give you qualitatively different results at all? Um, just, it's just not at the same scale of, yeah. of policy, so it's, it's sort of hard to say, you know, yeah. hundreds versus thousands. Um, and the pinning environment is very different as well. We've got a lot more pinning sites in this one. So, excellent. Yeah. All right. Thank you, George. Uh, let's thank George again. Uh, and next, we have the other Daniel Price, who's going to close up the session. Uh, I'll let you know when you've got two minutes to go. Uh, total disruptions, something, something. Okay. <laughs> oh. All right, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm aware it's like just before lunch, so I'll try and think about, get you thinking about lunch at least. So this is a calculation of the, uh, sorry, camera's here. I'll just want this back in my head for the camera. <laughs> all right, here we are. Uh, all right, so this is a calculation we did, uh, actually most of a year on All-Star. Um, Started by a PhD student, but it sort of outlived him, so I've had to do a lot of work to finish it off. But basically, it's the first simulation we managed to do where we actually simulated the total disruption of a solar mass star around a you know, typical supermassive black hole, 
um, and managed to follow it for a whole year post disruption. All right, but the basic take home if you're fast asleep is that luminosity has got nothing to do with M dot. All right, so obviously they have different dimensions, but you can whack a GM on C squared on the left hand side of an epsilon, uh, and you can pretend that M dot gives you a luminosity. And this is what's been done in tidal disruption uh, for a long time. So here's a very simple reason why. Um, thinking about yesterday's talk on climate change. So here's Peter Tuttle, and you can observe with your camera on the right there his luminosity. So what's his luminosity? Well, he's just a black body emitting at 300 degrees Kelvin, and his luminosity, if you just do his surface area times sigma t to the four, is about one by 10 to the 10 eggs per second. So he's a very you know, normal, kind of boring object. You got a great, nice talk, Peter. Um, but so when you might think about his M dot. So Peter probably had pizza for lunch, maybe for breakfast, and if he's a student, he would have had it for dinner as well. Um, now the average daily adult is supposed to consume uh, 8,700 kilojoules per day. So his M dot, the luminosity from his M dot, is basically uh, about six by 10 to the 10 eggs per second, if he sticks to the dietary requirements, but he probably didn't. Uh, which probably means there's at least a factor of 10 here difference between the M dot and his luminosity. Now, what's the reason for that? So basically, we would conclude here that Tuttle is underluminous compared to his like, energy input rate. Now, what's the reason for that? Well, this uh, material comes out not only by radiation, but also by advection um, and also by outflows. Now, Peter probably wasn't sick uh, yesterday. Uh, but, you know, obviously a lot of energy is just expended by breathing and emitting material. All right, so we're going to get to exactly the same point about tidal disruption. It's just a funny way around. Uh, but in, this is the big thing, is if you then observe Peter, uh, his luminosity as a function of time during the day, uh, there's nothing really about Peter's light curve that correlates with his pizza consumption. Except, so you might notice, for example, he doesn't eat pizza in the night. Uh, which is when he's kind of under luminous. He's basically you know, increasing luminosity during the day and then he stops eating pizza uh, and then his luminosity fades again. But you know, can you tell at what time Peter consumed a pizza? Not really. And like, does it correlate with exactly how his digestion is working? Not really. All right, so tidal disruption events, uh, here it goes. So the standard idea about tidal disruptions comes from this seminal paper by Reese. Uh, in 1988, and students, even Reese, made mistakes. So there's a correction by Finney in 1989. We have a very simple argument that if you put a star on a parabolic orbit, um, which is the expected, um, you know, basically marginally bound orbit the stars are supposed to fall towards black holes on, then basically half the star will be bound and fall towards the black hole, and half the star will be unbound and fly off. And there's a very simple argument that if you distribute the mass evenly in energy, which is not a perfect assumption, but it's not bad for certainly the end time of a tidal disruption event, that the mass return rate will go like 10 to the minus five thirds, at least at late times. So uh, kind of stupidly, um, you know, people then go looking for light curves that go like 10 to the minus five thirds, because if, if you make L proportional to M dot, you're gonna get 10 to the minus five thirds in your light curve. Right, but you know the answer already, as observations of tidal disruption events, so first of all, the first surprise is you, know, you might think accreting onto a black hole, you're going to get X-rays. And actually tidal disruption events have mostly been discovered in a UV and optical, which is totally weird, but maybe not surprising. So pretty much, uh, well, so the first sort of tidal disruption events optical was detected in 2011 and been very helpfully catalogued by people like Katie, um, who's now here at Melbourne Uni. Um, so here's a recent collection where they've actually been caught, the rise of the light has actually been caught. And indeed, the luminosity is very low, like under luminous. So 10 to the 43 to 10 to the 44 eggs per second is not what you get from feeding a solar mass to a black hole you know, in the course of a year. Um, there's a very unusually large emission region. So if you, well, work out the temperatures, which are about 10 to the four Kelvin, so basically a kind of hot star, temperature, that's very low for something that's accreting onto a black hole. Uh, and you just simply divide the luminosity by, you know, four pi r squared, then you get a sort of a mission region of like something like 10 to 100 AU, which is way, way bigger than the event horizon, which is about a half an AU. All right, so these are like the key things that everyone's like totally confused about in tidal disruption events. 
And also there's observed to be very strong outflows from broad lines. But you know the answer to this. What's the answer? Sorry. It's got nothing, this is, this has got nothing to do with pizza. So what you're observing is nothing to do with like really how the black hole eats. You can't see the digestion process, but just seeing something on the outside. And it may not surprise you, but so this is a compilation by Katie again, 2017. Uh, if you try to make uh, parallel indices from this or light curves, you get anything you want. Anything between minus three and positive, where you're sort of looking for a t to minus five thirds. Uh, so the puzzle is kind of all these things, is why are they the wrong temperature, why are they too low, why don't they follow this 2 minus 5 thirds thing anywhere. And part of the problem, um, well, so, so a very good solution has been proposed, uh, which is basically the pizza thing, which is basically you can't see Peter's stomach, can't see what's going into it, what you see is it's a big envelope on the outside, so here's the Eddington envelope on the left, which is proposed back in 1997, so lots of people have done work on this from a phenomenological point of view, I figured out this is you know, very likely the answer. Uh, and here's a tunnel envelope on the left there, it's just that you can't see inside. Yep, so that's uh, thought by many people to be the answer, but with no real kind of solid um, you know, preference for why that is, and lots of arguments about other models as well. All right, and the puzzle really is it's very difficult to simulate a total disruption event without cheating because of the range of time scales. So people tend to cheat, there's a cheater, um, so, for example, you can cheat by reducing the mass ratio, using not proper GR, using post-Newtonian approximations, only simulating the first disruption and sort of hoping that the material is going to come back in these kind of orbits, uh, or, you know, just put stars in bound orbits instead of parabolic orbits to reduce the time scales. So we may to do it without cheating. Uh, I'll show you it quick and then I'll show you it slow. But basically, without cheating means a 10 to 6 solar mass black, mass black hole, solar mass star, parabolic orbit, you want to follow the debris all the way until it comes back again. When it comes back again, funky stuff should happen involving GR, namely the material should process according to GR. Recession can be very helpful because it makes the streams collide instead of going back on the original parabolic orbits. Should be some initiation of accretion flow, which hopefully drives some kind of like outflows. Uh, and this should all happen over the course of about a year. All right, so here it is. Here's the year in life of tidal disruption event done in, uh, actually we did in the Kerr metric, but we don't spin in this case. Um, but the spin is not very important anyway, as it turns out, with just an adiabatic approximation. So it's going to go quick. Here's a whole year in a, in a bit less than a minute. But basically the star disrupts, half the star flies up to infinity, the bound stream comes back, the stream interacts with itself. And then this is what you would typically look for, you know, here it is, we kind of almost formed a disk, which is almost says some kind of eccentric thing. But this is completely missing the point. So I'll go through it again because this is what people love to know about tidal disruption events. So just more slowly, oh, let's go back, sorry. So there's the disruption. Half the star's unbound flying away, half the star's bound coming back. Second passage, here it is. So the thing that makes material fall towards the black hole is this relativistic precession. So the material processes, string collides. When the string collides, it's the material that's like very, uh, that's able to fall towards the black hole. And so it initiates the secretion flow. Um, but again, if you just look at this interior region, this sort of 50 AU little interior, that's not what you observe. So if you actually look at what you observe on much larger scales, so here's just a very simple ray tracing where I just took electron scattering opacity, um, you know, Newtonian approximation. So what is this thing going to look like? And what you find is basically a very optically thick 10 to the 4 degree Kelvin bubble that just envelops this whole thing and you can't see inside. So basically the take home message is the first time we've been able to simulate this thing, which is basically the optically thick outer envelope of a tidal disruption event. And the properties are more or less what you're hoping for. So, um, you know, very low density, velocities are sort of around the 10,000 kilometers a second, temperatures around 10 to the 4 Kelvin, the mass budget might not surprise you, Basically, none of it's gone into the black hole. 1% of the stars ended up in the black hole. 30% is in this outflowing envelope, and 67% is, well, obviously 50% is flying away in the unbound stream. So only 15% of that is still to come after a year. Um, so you know, very little of it's um, advected, basically. Um, and that little that's advected is used to power this, most of the material actually in these unbound outflows. And hence, that's the obscuring material that obscures the inside of the black hole. So the comparison with observations is actually not perfect. Um, 
But, you know, we're in the ballpark. So that's a very new thing for tidal disruption events. So we're in the right orders of magnitude compared to the other things. The black lines there are just uh, products from our simulations and the dots are uh, the observations. Okay, so basically we get emission regions. Actually, our, our tidal disruption is kind of curious. It actually very slowly rises. And such slowly rising tidal disruption events usually wouldn't be classified as a tidal disruption event. So it's possible that actually our, our TDE in the simulation beta equals one, which is just tidal radius equals um, the pericenter radius, uh, this actually would be too slow to be classified as a tidal disruption event. But again, you know, that's in the details. Uh, the basic uh, ballpark thing you hear is all, all just makes sense. Um, that why, you know, you, would, you don't see X-ray emission, for example, very commonly in tidal disruption events. We do have an explanation for that as well, is that once this material retreats, you can see to the inside, and then you do get some soft X-rays, also depending on the line of sight. So short summary, Anderson envelopes, otherwise known as optically thick outer regions, are the likely solution to the puzzle of TDE optical UV emission. People know this anyway, but we haven't got a simulation that's been able to show that. Um, we've got basically new stuff as we've managed to produce oneself consistently by a lot of hard work. So there's some obvious caveats. Um, we only use polytropic stars, but it's a real one. And radiation pressure is pretty important in how this envelope actually expands, and we didn't take that into account. So thanks very much. Thanks for a fantastic talk, Daniel. Um, the first question is uh, how much OSTAR time do you need to simulate advection through Peter Tut Hill? No, okay, sorry, no one found that amusing at all. Uh, Adele asks 30% of mass in unbound outflow seems large compared to what we observe in radio emission from TDEs. Do you think there are many outflows occurring and we are only observing a small subset? Um, well, so I'd just like to have a go at, at the radio emission. Um, so I don't know is the answer, but the, the radio emission I strongly suspect is everything that's outside this optically thick envelope would be optically thin. And there's a lot of material out there that would probably uh, interact. Uh, actually, I have a hidden, oh, I don't have a hidden slide on this one. Um, but there's basically a lot of material that is optically thin, um, and that would probably emit synchrotron. So uh, I don't know about the fraction, but the, there's definitely stuff that would emit in the radio at large radio. Watch this space. Uh, Rio asks, would we expect to see any emission from the stream stream emission itself before everything's obscured? Um, no. Uh, I, think, I think we've put that to bed. I think that's one of the things we managed to put to bed is people speculate about stream stream interaction as a source of the optical emission. And I think it's absolutely clear yet almost nothing from that, at least in our sort of synthetic light curves. There's basically nothing from this, that shark. Katie seems very happy with that <laughs> response. <laughs> um, and one last question before we uh, can break for lunch or breakfast, depending on what state you're in. Simon Murphy asks, how easy is it to account for radiation pressure and non-polytropic models? Why didn't you do it? Would you expect it to make much difference? Uh, we didn't do it because we were thick. Um, <laughs> Well, basically, you know, we made simple approximations using the 80 bat state. Um, it's not, it's a little bit difficult because we're using, uh, we're using the relativistic hydrodynamics. So it's a little bit more tricky than it would be in the Newtonian case, just because of the way you solve things. Um, not like beyond a student project. So that'll be certainly the next follow up. Polytropic star again, just for simplicity. We just did something simple to start with. That's what we've done before. Um, but again, that's not particularly difficult for the team. So we've been, doing lots of like ingesting stellar models into the code through Mont Clouds work, for example, um, that we can just disrupt a star instead of watching it sit there. So they're both relatively easy, but we didn't do them in this project. Fantastic. All right, uh, let's thank Daniel and all of the speakers in the morning session again. <laughs>